Gabor, what a opportunity to sit and talk to you today. I'm um, I'm ready to listen and to learn more about your your amazing work. Thanks for having me. Um, this wonderful book, uh, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness and Healing in a Toxic Culture, taught me a hell of a lot. I mean, it's a hearty book. It's almost an encyclopedia of mental, emotional and physical health. Let's perhaps start with the toxic bit, because yeah. I think most of us have an understanding that we live in a toxic culture. But as you say, it's been completely normalized. So we're sort of numb to a lot of it. H yeah. How would you describe that our culture as being toxic? Well, a, a toxic culture can uh, undermine people's health by two ways. By one, by doing bad things to them that are hurtful. Um, or it can deprive them of human needs for healthy development. And this one does it both. So in terms of deprivation of needs, the way we gestate babies, a lot of women being very stressed during pregnancy, that already has an impact on the developing infant. The way we birth, birth has been completely medicalized so that the natural birth process that is meant to be a, a bonding experience between infant and mother is largely interfered with and made into a difficult and uh, almost pathological process. That has an impact on mother-infant relationships. Then the way young families are kind of sequestered on their own and stressed, so that the stresses of the parents invariably get absorbed by the children. Then the parenting advice that a lot of young mothers and fathers get about how to treat children completely undermines children's needs for acceptance, love, unconditional belonging, uh, being understood, having their emotions respected. These are largely unknown qu qualities in this culture. So we get the very beginnings wrong which is hugely important because the human brain develops in interaction with their environment, being in utero, and much of the development happens in the first three years. So if we get the first three years wrong, we have a lot of catching up to do. Mm. So that's one way. The other way, of course, are when people are actually treated badly, such as in child abuse, which happens all too often, such as in parents still spanking their kids, which has been shown to be as deleterious as more... Um, harsher forms of abuse in terms of long-term impact on children, um, such as the, the emotional, physical abuse that many children undergo. Um, then, uh, again, there's the stress on parents, which again, like for example, economic stress on mothers translates into physiological stress markers in children. So the inequality, the uncertainty in this culture, in Britain, the rising rates of poverty, the uh, rising inequality. Um, there was an article in The Guardian just the other day that there were about 300,000 deaths attributable to austerity policies. Um, then there is the questions of race and gender. Women, for example, develop autoimmune disease at much higher rates than men do. About 70 to 80 percent of autoimmune disease happens to women. And why is that? Is that purely due to if they've chosen to be a mother, if and that the stress is there, or is it just something about how we're it's, it's, it's not It's not an automatic outcome of mothering, but it is an automatic mother uh, outcome of mothering in a context that puts all the emotional stress and pressure on women. Mm. So women in this culture are very often expected not just to look after the children, but also to absorb and look after the emotional needs of their spouses while denying their own. And those are powerful triggers for physiological stress responses and the fraying of chromosomes and the turning off of inflammatory genes. So that's why more autoimmune disease amongst women. It's not a biologically determined issue. It's a cultural issue based on the role that women have to play. And furthermore, of course, when you add to that, for example, the pressures of race, you expect even more autoimmune, autoimmune disease, which is exactly what you find, so that if you're a woman and of a minority woman, your risk of autoimmune disease is that much higher. So it has to do with stress. Yeah. Um, so I could go on. Then there's the uh, stress of political culture, the rancor, the hostility, the lack of power that most people experience, a lack of power, loss of control, are significant markers, in fact, triggers for stress. There's so many things about this culture that for all our technological and medical advances actually undermine health. Then not to mention the utterly inadequate education of physicians who simply are not taught about the scientifically demonstrated of mind-body unity, 
So when they look on illness, they look at purely biological parameters, and all they try to do is to somehow improve or mitigate the biological effects of long-term stresses, but they don't understand the relationship between stress, trauma, and physiology, uh, a relationship that's scientifically not in doubt, but in medical practice is completely ignored. So there's so many factors. I know. I mean, I've got uh, a thousand questions from, from yeah. what you've just said. I guess we'll start where where you've just ended up there, talking about how you know science has established this relationship between stress and a physical outcome. Yeah. But the medical world aren't acting upon that. And you put something in the book about, you know, simple ways that this could be rectified, even on a, a GP level, would yeah. be if someone comes in with an ailment, a, a problem, to say, yeah. how was your childhood? Yeah. But but those questions, and we, we all know that doctors are, you know, stressed, underpaid, don't yeah. have any time. So this is they, not possible. Uh, they, and they also don't have the education. That's the main problem. Mm. I mean, it's true. Doctors are a very stressed bunch. Um, a study of medical students showed that the highest level of empathy for physicians occurs when they just begin their training. Wow. And and that's beca- and also another study of medical students showed that if you look at chromosomal markers of aging, medical students age faster than their age-related cohorts. So medical training is very stressful, often traumatic, and um, physicians are not expected to take any time for their own mental, physical health. They're not trained in understanding the mind-body unity. They're taught nothing about trauma and its highly demonstrated impact on the physiology of illness. So they're, first of all, overstressed. Secondly, partially traumatized. Thirdly, deprived of essential information. And then fourthly, expected to do a lot in a very short period of time. So let's go back one step from someone having to appear in front of a doctor. Yeah. We're on a global level not taking stress seriously enough. No. We Again, it's something that's been completely normalized. Everyone's stressed. Yeah. Everyone's racing through the day. Everyone's dealing with these normalized toxicities. Yeah. We need to deal with that with more seriousness and go, how much stress am I allowing into my life? And some of it does, I guess, fill out of our hands at times, especially when I guess it comes from passed down trauma. And that will depend on where you live in the world, mm-hmm. Uh, which culture you you live in, etc. But we're not we're not taking it seriously enough, and it feels like there needs to be a global effort to reduce stress. But we're so far from that happening because it seems a lot of these toxicities and stresses you follow the route back, and it ends up at money. Someone's making money out of yeah. your stress. Yeah. Well, if you look at the scientific literature on what triggers people's stress, it's uncertainty. Uh, conflict and loss of control, which pretty much characterizes life under globalized capitalism yeah. for, for a lot of people around the world. So when you say we need to make an effort to reduce stress, uh, I'm, what I'm actually arguing is that stress is a very function of the particular system that we're living under. So that, yes, we can do a lot individually to recognize stress and to reduce it and um, and not to generate more stress for ourselves as best we can. That's entirely possible and, and even necessary. But then there's also these broader conditions. I mean, it's, it's hard to tell uh, advice. Uh, like a Canadian health expert said, if you don't want to get sick, uh, don't be poor. Don't get a house. Don't, don't live near a railway line. Don't get a job in a toxic industry and go on lots of vacations to sunny climes. Yeah. You know, th- that's This all. is a structural problem, a societal. We've got to dismantle it, which is th- this is a stru- <laughs> insurmountable. Yeah. I'm arguing that these are structural problems. And yeah. So that the, the, the toxicity of these cultures that by its very nature, it generates these pressures on people. So that disease is not an abnormality. It's a normal response to an abnormal set of circumstances. Yeah, well, like you said, you know, I was very shocked to read the direct correlations between certain illnesses and circumstances. For Uh instance, if you look at racism, a huge proportion of people that have dealt with that end up with asthma. And that is a a direct um, attack on the inflammatory immune system that that causes the asthma. Well, or, or a recent study that came out after the book was published four weeks ago that after an episode of racism, there's a serious disturbances of the immune system, you know, so that these emotional stresses, socially engendered, 
have significant physiological consequences. Um, so again, women of color are much more likely to have autoimmune diseases than anybody else in Canada. Where I live, the rate of rheumatoid arthritis amongst indigenous women is six times that of anybody else. This is amongst the population that never used to have autoimmune disease. Mm. So it's, as you say, it's, it's these stresses that set off inflammation in the body. Mm. And again, a Canadian study, men who had been sexually abused in childhood have tripled the rate of heart attacks as adults. Um, women sexually abused have much higher rates of endometriosis, which itself is a debilitating condition and is a risk factor for um, ovarian cancer. And a recent study from Harvard showed that women with severe PTSD symptoms have doubled the risk of ovarian cancer. So that you simply can't separate people's emotional lives engendered by social circumstances from their physiology. But of course, the average physician is just not introduced to that information at all. Yeah, they're looking directly at the physical outcome rather than exactly. the, the causality of, of that problem. So yeah. what option do people have to, to look at their own inner healing from the past, perhaps generational trauma, if it's mm -hmm. indigenous peoples? Is that the option? Well, the options are both personal and social. So on a social level, one can easily, and I do make some very straightforward recommendations, which is, which are at least theoretically, are far from impossible in practice. Um, the system militates against them. For example, you could introduce trauma education into medical schools. The average medical student doesn't hear a single lecture on trauma, even though, as a British psychologist, Richard Bentall points out, a member of the British Academy, he said that the evidence linking childhood adversity to mental illness in adulthood is as strong as the evidence linking cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Wow. And despite that, the average medical student and not even the average psychiatrist has got any clue about the traumatic basis of virtually all mental illnesses. So we could introduce trauma education. We could teach medical students about the elegantly and voluminously demonstrated mind-body unity which shows that our emotional lives are inseparable from our, from our hormones, from our immune apparatus, from our nervous systems. So that when you're dealing with physical health, you cannot ignore the whole person. And then we need to have what has been called a biopsychosocial view of human health, which means that the biology of the human organism is inseparable from the psychological and social environment. Mm. And it's very simple concepts more than adequately demonstrated by the research literature, completely unmentioned in most medical training, which is almost unbelievable. You could introduce um, the, the modern science of brain development to teachers, which shows that the human brain develops in interaction with the emotional environment from in utero to adulthood, which means that the most important job of the schools is not to teach kids what year, um, Wellington won the bottle of Waterloo, the bottle of Waterloo. I keep saying the bottle of Waterloo, it's the battle of Waterloo. <laughs> uh, but, but, but the most important job is to help develop healthy human brains. Yeah. And healthy human brains develop under conditions of safety, and under conditions of emotional contact. And those kids whose brain development is spontaneously healthy, they will want to learn about history. They'll want to learn about mathematics. They have a natural curiosity. They're a joy to teach. So the problem is not to cram them full of information on the one hand, only then to discipline what we consider bad behaviors, but to actually help the healthy development of the brain, which has to do with, again, safety and the emotional relationships. And furthermore, in education, when a, children, when a child does behave in ways that are not acceptable, instead of making a villain out of them and punishing them, like the London Daily Telegraph suggests, introducing, reintroducing caning into the schools. Not that long ago, they had this brilliant suggestion that we should traumatize children as a way of disciplining them. We could actually try to understand the emotional dynamics that lead a child to behave in certain ways. And in every case, that child is in emotional pain. And that pain has to do with the loss of their emotional needs and their lack of being understood by the adult world. I mean, these are huge social structures that, that need to be dismantled and and reinstated with 
you know, completely different mindset and completely different foundations. Do, are you hopeful that that will happen? Like, are we going to have to get to breaking point to see this change? Or are we already at it? I wonder how anybody's going to define breaking point. I mean, yeah. in the United States, there's a rising tide of uh, childhood suicides. And they keep wondering what's going on here. Well, they're not looking at how children are raised and the stresses in modern society. Um, in in Britain, in universities, there are higher rates of depression than ever used to be. So I, I don't know what anybody would consider a breaking point. I think we already had a breaking yeah. point. Um, the question is, are people as individuals willing to wake up? And then are we willing to, as a society, to do something about it? And as you kind of hinted earlier in this conversation, there are powerful interests that like it the way it is because they get to profit and they get to hold on to power. So that creates a real challenge for anybody who's looking for a genuine shift towards more humanity. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so huge that I think most of us feel a bit terrified about all of it, but we have to have some hope that there will be changes because I think, you know, I'm a parent. I'm certainly scared of, of yeah. the world that I'm, you yeah. know, raising my kids in. But yeah. also when I bring it down to the very, very personal level of being a mother and I've certainly felt those pressures that you've spoken about yeah. and I had a particularly stressful sort of exterior circumstance happen when I was pregnant with my first kid mm. and I've constantly worried about the impact that's had on my son because I, I know that I was under a lot of sort of mental pressure and stress and I have felt sick about it and I and I think I feel you know I, I've loved learning about these theories from your work and, and the other books that you've written but it terrifies me because I think every day that I'm parenting my kids oh my god how might I have totally messed up their life today how well, have I psychologically well, impacted them today it's it's well, terrifying well if I may say I wouldn't particularly advise you to approach your parenting task from a position of fear mm. that's going to tell on your kids as well yeah I mean this child that was that you carried when you were stressed oh, how's he doing He's doing all right. He ha he faces his challenges, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, stress on the mother during pregnancy is certainly a risk for learning problems in a child later on and, yeah. and attention problems and, 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 and learning difficulties, you know. So that's true. On the other hand, how old is he? Nine. Yeah. Well, you got lots of years to work with. Yeah. And so, you know, as a father, I, I used to project a lot of my guilt and anxiety onto my kids. That doesn't help them. No. They need to be seen for who they actually are. I'm pretty sure if I met your son, I'd find a pretty lovely young fellow. And, he is. And most, people, <laughs> and most people would say that, you know. So when you look at them through the eyes of your own anxiety and perhaps your own guilt, you're not really seeing him. Yeah. So I would... I would work on that aspect of your mm. of your relationship because he doesn't need you to. No, I, I, I absolutely know he doesn't. And then looking at these, um, again, normalized <laughs> methods that we've yeah. seen probably in the last 50 years with, yeah. for example, leaving a child to cry it out rather yeah. than yeah. soothe them when they're going to sleep. All these, yeah. I think most parents enter parenthood, they may have read several books or listened to podcasts about parenthood and gone, Oh God, what technique do I apply here? Do I do the crying out yeah. or do I? And and everybody seems so emphatically sure with their methods. Well, and they, they are because they're cut off from their in instincts and intuitions and the mind can make up anything. But let me ask you this. When you even think of letting your child cry and not picking them up, what do you feel in your heart? It's a horrible feeling. Yeah. But, horrible. But that's your mother instinct. Mm. And people in the society are constantly advised to ignore their instincts. Yeah. I mean, there's a parenting instinct, not just in us, but in all mammals. Because without the parenting care, the, in, the million infants just doesn't survive. Mm. You try and tell a mother gorilla not to pick up their kid when they're distressed. You'll see what mother rage is all about, you know. So, but as human beings, we become denatured. Mm. We've been, we become caught up from our instincts. So experts, so-called, can tell us all kinds of nonsense. And... Um, in this world that worships expertise, so-called, people uh, are intimidated rather than paying attention to their own gut feelings in there or what, what their own heart is telling them. And so part of the, uh, the art of parenting is just to get back to our parenting instincts. Yeah, I mean, your work has been massively relieving to me in that yeah, way because, yeah. for instance, 
my daughter, who's seven, will sometimes still wake in the night. And yeah. I've been either my husband or I will get into bed next to her and then she goes back off to sleep. Wonderful. And f- for a while, my husband and I were like, oh, God, we've got to get out of this habit. You know, how do we how do we, you know, sort of get her to feel more confident <coughs> and independent in, in the evenings? And reading your work, I was like, oh, we don't. We can just stay in the well, bed with her. I guarantee you that by the time she's 17, she won't want any. No, no, bed. she, you know? she so, we won't fit so, in with her. <laughs> so it's only a matter of uh, development. But, you know, what that really is is a vestige of human evolution because throughout evolution, eons of evolution, Kids didn't sleep separately from their parents. Well, of course, yeah. You know, in, fa- in fact, they couldn't because they didn't have the rooms, you know, <laughs> to, to separate into. So, yeah, you're doing the right thing by because it's in, again safety and being responded to. You, you know, some people say you're coddling the child. No, you're not. You're meeting the child's needs. You can't. You can certainly spoil children, but spoiling usually means that you're trying to compensate through physical gifts what you haven't provided emotionally yeah yeah you can't give a child too much love you simply can't it's impossible in fact one study showed they looked at a whole bunch of mothers the researchers rated most of the mothers as good you know caring and some as super moms these are the kids the mothers that really just doted on their babies and just flooded them with care and love and a few mothers were just not adequate. They, they had their own stuff, so they couldn't be there for their infants. Now, when they looked at the population of kids 30 years later, the ones that functioned the best were the ones that got this abundance of caring and love. So yeah. the conclusion of the researchers was that you can't love kids too much, Yeah. number one. And number two, that we need to protect the relationship between parents and children which I don't, right away thought is itself a sign of cultural toxicity because why do we have to protect something? Why is it under threat mm. that we have to protect it in the first place? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so interested in this and I, I've talked about this in this space but in other spaces too because I, I keep coming back to it on a on a very personal level knowing that my grandmother who had had a particularly rough time being evacuated in the war yes. had my mum very young wasn't mentally equipped to be a mother um, and I love my grandmother very much but she she wasn't able to give my yeah. mum that love and that support and you know me and my mum have more recently really started to talk about that mm-hmm. and seeing the hugely detrimental impact that's had on her mental health which she's yeah. very well aware of and we've well, talked well, about well there's studies about that there's been studies done in Finland where the children of those mothers that were evacuated when they were children are doing less well from the point of view of mental health. Yeah. A British study, a British study showed that, you know, during the Luftwaffe bombings of Britain, um, some kids were evacuated to be strangers in the countryside to protect them from the stress yeah. and the danger of bombing. Others stayed in the bomb shelters and in the underground with their parents here in London, the ones who stayed with their parents despite the bombing, were emotionally more healthy afterwards yeah. than the ones who had been evacuated. Yeah. That's that's how important the parental attachment relationship is to healthy human development. Yeah, it's, um, it's remarkable. And I think a lot of it is very, very relieving in terms of mm. breaking out of all of these rule books and these parenting guides that tell us, we, you know, we need to leave the kid or whatever. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's deeply liberating. On a, again, a real daily level, as a working mum myself, I think I have really struggled with parts of this, um, you know, I can feel it, a visceral need to be with my kids because I also want to work, if I'm completely honest. I love what I do. I need to work to keep everything running as it is. (laughs) Um, And I felt very torn and on yeah. a real day-to-day level, say my daughter even now will sometimes go, oh, mum, come and snuggle me on the sofa. And I'll go, I-, I actually can't right now because I'm cooking. And then as soon as I've made dinner, we need to get the homework done. And it, you are on this sort of routine throughout the day with your kids due to perhaps their schooling, your work. And I feel a discomfort about yeah. it, but I also yeah. don't see a way out to stick to that. But also... I think for women to be able to show that we can be CEOs, leaders, business owners, how the hell do we navigate it and and feel okay about what we're doing? 
Well, yeah. As regards your daughter, um, you might genuinely not be able to take the time to respond when she's asking. But what you can do is to compensate for it. Yeah. So later on, when you have a free moment, you initiate the contact and say, hey, you, come here. Oh, I'm constantly I, I, kissing her face yeah, the whole time. Oh, okay, okay, great. So mm. then, 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 then you're actually inviting and providing the contact when you can. Yeah. Well, that's good. Then you're doing what you need to do. Yeah. You're doing what you can do. <clears throat> in terms of women's position in the world, one marker of what's happening is the rising rate of multiple sclerosis amongst women. So, and multiple sclerosis... For those, well, if any physicians, physicians are listening here, the person who first described multiple sclerosis was a French neurologist, Charcot, in the 19th century. And he said this was a stress-driven disease. Now, since then, there's been all kinds of research linking stress and trauma to multiple sclerosis. So, since the 19th, which information, by the way, just doesn't penetrate the medical schools. So, if you go through, a, see a neurologist with your multiple sclerosis flare-up, they're going to give you the cortisol, which is the stress hormone, to relieve the inflammation, but they're never going to ask you about stress in your life mm. or your childhood trauma. And, it, and yet I know, I know lots of examples of people who actually take on their stresses and traumas, and the disease gets a whole lot better. Having said that, since the 1930s, the gender ratio of multiple sclerosis has been increasing. So that what I mean is that it used to be almost equal, now it's three and a half women to every man. Wow. Yeah. Which immediately <coughs> excuse me, tells us that this is not a genetic condition because genes don't change in a population over you know a few decades. It's not climate or uh, diet or climate because that hasn't changed more for one gender than the other. What is it? It's stress. So women have always had the role of being the emotional shock absorbers of their families, including their spouses. Yeah. In fact, during COVID. The New York Times had an article called Society's Shock Absorbers about how women took on the stresses of their families and their spouses and they felt guilty when they couldn't protect their husbands from stress. So that's a, a, a gender role not biologically determined but dictated by a certain patriarchal view of women's position. Now, in the meanwhile, for two reasons, women have also entered the workforce since the 30s in many cases out of economic necessity. In other cases, because as you say, people have a desire and need and the right to express themselves and, 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 and not to be constricted in their range of endeavors in this world, which all would have been fine if the stress role had been shared by the genders, mm. but it hasn't been. So now you got double the stress, or you have, you have to make it out there, yeah. and you're still doing playing the same role at home. And as a third factor, which is the increasing rates of loneliness and isolation. So uh, loneliness itself and the atomization of communities and the breakup of um, extended families means that women are more alone now with the parenting task and with the stress, stress task. Well, you get more stress, less support, more disease. Mm. We so, have these nuclear families that we've yeah, again normalized yeah, that 100 yeah, years ago, yeah. you would have had grandmas, aunties, cousins, <laughs> everyone involved, but... Well, let, we me don't tell you have about, that. let me tell you about an amazing study that some geniuses um, conducted uh, just a few years ago. It's good you're sitting down because you'd fall over with amazement <laughs> if uh, if you weren't. You know what they found out? And I don't know how many PhDs it took to figure this one out, but they did research that showed that grandmothers are, grandmothers are good for grandkids. <laughs> and and even more <laughs> even more astonishingly, they found out that the closer the grandmother lives to the grandchild, even better. Now, can you believe that? <laughs> I think we probably could have worked that one out over a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but again, you know, out of necessity or people, I guess, meeting partners from other parts of the world or country, we are tending to move away from where we grew up, where the yeah. rest of our family dwells. Yeah. And yeah. again, all of this has been normalised and we're probably not looking at the the cost that it has on our yeah. our mental health. And, you know, I, I don't live particularly near my parents and um, my husband's mum died a long time ago. So mm. we certainly haven't had that very close-knit sort of community feel raising yeah. a kid, like most people I know who have yeah. moved away from the family area. 
And I don't think we really, and I think, yeah, loneliness is such a big part of it. And it's probably why all of these, you know, parenting blogs exist or mum yeah. blogs or yeah. mum websites, yeah. because people feel like, who do I turn to? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to navigate this because I don't have the matriarch to speak to or whoever it is in my yeah. community to get that comfort from. And I think women are expected, certainly as new mothers, to just sort of crack on with it yeah. and go, yep, yeah, come on. You're all right, crack on with it. You're sleep deprived. You're carrying yeah. such a load. Your whole life has changed within a moment. It's... And, and, and you're largely alone with it. Yeah. You know, I mean, what you mentioned, those initiatives for um, websites or, or block mums, I mean, those are healthy adjustments. Yes. To an unhealthy uh, situation, for sure. Yeah. And this is, you know, these are some of the things that people can do once they understand what the problem is. There are initiatives people can take on the local level. Mm. Um, I know in Britain, I don't know if this is still extant, but some years ago they appointed a minister for loneliness. Mm. I don't know if they still have a minister for loneliness. I think we do. But and, but but, yeah. but really that's just um, playing with surface symptoms. Yeah. I mean, what governments don't look at are the social economic drivers of, of loneliness and under... Neo, the neoliberal regime since Thatcher and Reagan and their, you know, other party f followers in the same parties they belong to or the, even the opposition parties, there's not a whole lot of difference. Mm. And so social economic conditions, uh, rising inequality, rising stress, are continuing to drive the epidemic of loneliness that these governments are not going to look at. Mm. because that's not in their interest to do so. so they'll, they'll fiddle with the effects and maybe introduce some good programs, but they will not deal with causes. No, not at all. But I think, do you know what? It's so liberating, I think, for everybody to hear, oh, it's okay that I'm not dealing with this life very well because yeah. this is extraordinary in terms of stress, loneliness, all the things that we've just listed. Yeah. And I think most people think, oh, God, why am I not coping? There must be something wrong with me. I yeah. must be flawed in some way to not have the strength to cope, mental, physical, emotional strength. And well, it's like, and we, you know, and we you shouldn't be. And you know what? Sorry to interrupt. The politicians will reinforce that message because uh, Tony Blair, uh, as I quote him in the book, was once talking about this is like diabetes and conditions like obesity. And he said, these are not epidemics. These are the products of a million individual decisions. The heck they are. You know, the junk food that people eat is very much the result of a very well-documented conspiracy on the part of the food companies yeah. to make people addicted to sugar, salt, and fat. People soothe themselves. They stress. They soothe their stresses by eating greasy foods uh, and sweet, sweet foods, which temporarily act like a drug in the brain. Uh, why are people stressed? That has to do with social conditions. Um, so... Governments will decry the effects of their policies, but they will not look at the sources of those effects yeah. in, in their own actions. So then it is left to us. The responsibility <coughs> is on our shoulders, either to form communities and and try and create change yeah. or to make incremental change in our own lives, I guess. All that. But meanwhile, governments will keep pointing the fingers at, fingers yeah, at, yeah. at individuals saying it's your fault. You made the wrong decisions, mm -hmm. you know, and... and uh, this this whole myth that's another myth of this culture is that we're sort of separate solo selves um, without looking at actually the interactions of our brains with the brains of other people the inter you know I talk about interpersonal biology our biology is very much shaped by our relationships those relationships happen in a context that context is the community any extended family or the multi-generational family that we live in in the context for all that is the broader culture. So again, we're biopsychosocial creatures and the whole tendency under capitalism to individualize everything uh, and then to make individuals culpable for how they're, if you're not succeeding, you're just not a good person. You're yeah. Not, you know, it's so toxic. It's so toxic and it's so huge. It feels like every big structure needs to be dismantled and reinstated for us to find some peace. It's, it's bonkers. And, you know, a lot of these uh, disconnections that you've talked about 
are due to trauma and that yeah. could very well be ancestral trauma and that will be dependent <coughs> on where you live in the world culturally yeah. the environment you're brought up in because of course indigenous peoples would have experienced very specific trauma at a specific time due yeah. colonization yeah. whereas for the rest of the world it could be for any number of reasons the structures we find ourselves in but one of those one of the results of that trauma is that disconnection from ourselves from yeah. other people from nature a full disconnect and i think again that's been totally normalized not necessarily talked about but it's just like you say the individual living its individual world with an individual phone and imbibing yeah. this information how do you even start to notice if you are disconnected i think is the first point because some mm. people won't even know that they have that disconnect due to their own trauma yeah um well, first of all, I'm glad you men mentioned the digital stuff because this is called social media, but it's totally anti-social media. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, everywhere you go, you see people um, absorbed in their cell phones, not looking at each other at all. Yeah. <coughs> and those communications on social media are very catered and uh, mm, artificial communications. Because, see, right now, as we're sitting here talking, we're looking at each other, you have a certain expression in your face, you're nodding your head, you're interacting, <laughs> you know, you're interacting with me. Yeah. You know, I'm reading your body language and you're reading mine. There's a human interaction going on. That doesn't happen nope. on social media. So this so-called social media, this connectivity, actually is the language and technology of disconnection. Mm. You know, you take something like Facebook. I mean, even the name itself should tell you what it's about. Yeah. You're presenting a face to the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, a concocted face. Yeah. And if people like us, quote unquote, they don't like us, they don't even know us. No. But they, we're putting all of our self worth in uh, yeah, yeah. other people's hands yeah. constantly. That was the yeah. bit that I actually posted on social media a quote that you'd put in the book about that, that we are quite literally handing over yeah. the whole of our self worth to, it might not be on social media, it might <coughs> be to our friends, our work colleagues, yeah. whoever it is, but unless somebody else is validating us in some way, yeah. we don't feel like we can just own that self-worth or exactly. or have an understanding of who we are. And that's been absolutely normalized because you can quantify it on social media. Oh, yeah. how many people liked this picture? How many, normalized. How, how many quote-unquote friends do we have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Well, so as to your question about how do we reconnect, well, we have to get that we're disconnected. And we have to, first of all, really come to terms with that now. People do that by suffering, mm. unfortunately. Some people do it by grace. They say, this is just nuts. It's insane what we're doing here. But a lot of people have to suffer first. So when people suffer depression or anxiety or they notice they have trouble focusing or they have physical symptoms of all kinds, that's that can serve as a wake-up call that something is out of whack with our lives. And a lot of people will make that intuitive leap almost automatically. Not that um, they know the science behind it, but they just know that something is wrong with their lives. And unfortunately, the way we're constructed as human beings, we, we do have to suffer a bit. Most of it, I don't recommend suffering. It's just that the way it seems to work is that something has to happen to wake us up. Yeah. And in your case, it might be, um, you know, find yourself in a highly stressed state and you start worrying about your child, mm -hmm. or for another person, it might be a relationship breakup, it might be an illness, it might be a period of sleepless anxiety, um, just a sense of alienation, boredom, and just a sense of whose life am I leading anyway. Um, could be troubles with one's children. Um, so there's any number of ways that life is a way to poke us in the ribs and say, oh, you ain't going in the right direction. Mm. But then we have to make change, and humans aren't particularly great at that because there's well, risk then, or fear. Well, then we first have to ask what's going on. Yeah. I mean, before we come to... That's another tendency, I may say, of this culture as well. Here's a problem. What do we do about it? Well, I, I don't go there immediately. If there's a problem, let's really understand it. Yeah. Because it's from an understanding, it's from this <coughs> compassionate inquiry into the sources of our difficulties that the answers will emerge. Not by, here's a problem, how do I figure out what to do about it? Yeah. But here's a problem, how do I understand it? And from that understanding, 
answers will often very much emerge almost spontaneously. I mean, you've just mentioned compassion. I think self-compassion yeah. is again yeah. hugely lacking on yeah. mass with all of us. And I spend a lot of time talking about this because I can identify large periods of my own life previously where I've felt like that. And yeah. as you state in the book, another um, of the hangovers from trauma is shame. Yes. And I have absolutely drowned in shame at points of my life. And mm. of course, it extinguishes all self-compassion. Yeah. It's eradicated entirely. Yeah. So you can, I in that moment was perhaps looking at the problems, but I didn't have the self-compassion to then deal with it. I just yeah. felt like I was drowning in the problem. So can you switch on self-compassion? Is it practice? How do you believe we, we can, again, en masse cultivate self-compassion? Well, first of all, we notice when it's absent. Mm. So like, for example, when you're judging yourself more harshly than somebody else, than you would somebody else for the same dynamic. Oh, I'm not being compassionate to myself here. <coughs> no. Don't judge yourself for lacking self-compassion. That itself would not be compassionate. Mm -hmm. just, notice, just, just, <laughs> just, just, just notice it and get curious about it. You know, It just takes compassion and curiosity. And usually we can peel these layers one by one if you just keep asking compassionate questions. Like your lack of self-compassion. Um, have you met a one-day-old baby that lacks self-compassion? Oh, babies are just pure love, aren't they? Yeah. 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 So therefore... It's something that's not natural to us. Yeah. It's something that developed. Mm. And so, you know, at some point, even that guilting yourself played a positive role in your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't have taken it on. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know your particular background, but in general, when children are facing difficult circumstances, um, their natural tendency is to make it their own fault because children are developmentally narcissistic they, you know they think it's all about them <coughs> excuse me when things are going badly they think it's got to be my fault mm. now that is a positive now that may seem like a heavy burden and it is but it does have a positive um, side to it which is if it's my fault maybe i can do something about it mm. if, I'm, if i'm smart enough and active enough and compliant enough or good looking enough or adept enough or, or, or giving enough, nice enough, maybe I can compensate. Whereas if the child believes that the world is just chaotic and doesn't know how to love me and, and the parents are just not available, that's not tolerable. So it's actually protective of the child yeah. to develop this sense that oh, it's all my fault, but God, if I work hard enough, maybe I can reverse the situation. Mm. So even that self-shame, one can be compassionate towards mm. and see that at some point, it actually came along to play a positive role of, of helping me survive. Yeah, so we've, we've naturally got these capabilities. Society yeah. just sort of knocks it out of us as we as yeah. we get older and we're more indoctrinated by everything we're imbibing. You, I know you've shared this on plenty of other podcasts and certainly in your book, but you talk about in the book your own uh, manifestation of trauma. You yeah. grew up in wartime Hungary. Didn't grow up, spent my first year. Spent your first year there. Yeah. So you endured in that very short time hunger, dysentery, witnessing yeah. your mother's own distress from a, a baby's eye view. Yeah. Can you talk to us a bit about how that manifested? And I know it was around your 40s that you started to yeah. actually have this awareness that, that there was a manifestation of that trauma. Yeah, well, it manifested in a number of ways. Um, so both in the professional realm and also in my family life. In my personal life, it led to all kinds of suspicion, distrust, and um, easily woundability in my relationship with my wife. Because what I didn't realize that was being triggered are old wounds I sustained as an infant, but my mother just wasn't available for me. Now, it doesn't mean she didn't love me, but emotionally, she could not possibly have been available. Under the Nazis and, and, and her parents exterminated in Auschwitz, my father away in forced labor, and I being under threat and me being ill, I mean, all she could do was ensure our survival. And even that she couldn't be sure about. And at some point she gave me to a stranger just because I wouldn't have survived where we were living. So I can only interpret that as an abandonment. And if my mother is so stressed, it's my fault. And clearly I'm just not good enough. Um, so that then also means that in my marriage, 
when my wife isn't as available to me as I'd like her to be. I have the same sense of abandonment and the same pain. And I react with the same kind of withdrawal and coldness or perhaps rage. So that's what it means in terms of relationship. In terms of my parenting, because I have, there's nobody that was attuned with me to actually get my emotional realities as an infant and a young child. Not because my mother didn't love me, or my father when he came back from forced labor when I was a year and a half old. Not that he didn't love me. B but they didn't get me emotionally. They were way too stressed for that and traumatized. So I didn't get my kids emotionally. I just didn't see them for who they were. I saw them through the eyes of who I wanted them to be. Not through, oh, here you are. This is who you are. I want to get to know this and to love this person. So that was lacking. And I was also irritable. And the fights, you know, my wife and I created a very emotionally unsafe environment in our home for all the love that we had, for all the dedication that we poured in their direction and gave them. There was also tremendous uh, volatility. As my son, with whom I co-wrote this book, Daniel writes, he used to have this nightmare of the floor disappearing from under his feet, not knowing whenever the emotional atmosphere would become very unsafe and he would fall through the cracks. That's in the personal realm. In the, social, in, the, in, the, in the work realm, when, as an infant, you don't get the feeling that you're important, that you matter, which, is, which depends on the parent's attentive um, attitude towards you, where they really see you and hear you and validate you. My parents couldn't do that. So I get the sense, and then my mother gives me to a stranger. Well, I can't be very important. I don't matter. Well, you compensate for that by going to medical school and becoming a very good and busy and always available and never um, unavailable physician. Then you get it to be very important and you ignore your own family and you ignore your own health. So these are the ways that those early traumas then show up in people's adulthood, in their parenting, in their relationships, in their work. Mm, I, I always hugely appreciate you talking about that because I think sometimes when we read books from whether it's doctors, experts, world leaders, thought leaders, yeah. we can feel a bit like, oh, my God, well, they know everything and they're absolutely nailing it and doing it perfectly. And I'm not. I'm this yeah. little human who's getting it all wrong. So I think I've always really appreciated that in your work, that you are coming from such an honest place and that you've had that obviously acute self-awareness to, to look at your past and to write some of the things that you felt a, a discomfort with. How much, it's just very interesting hearing you talk about, you know, your determination, I guess, that sprung from that feeling of I'm not important as a child or as, yeah. a, as a baby. How much of that do you think still drives you today? You know, you're a globally well-known, respected um, thought leader and doctor. How much of that is still driving you to, to keep working, to keep writing books, to keep talking? I don't think it's totally gone. Um, it's much less of a motivating dynamic in my life than it used to be. But honest to God, today as I sit here, I have to question myself because who in their right mind would sign up for a seven-week book tour <laughs> when they're traveling from one place to the other and talking multiple times a day, mm. you know? So if you'd asked me two days ago and... When I was just feeling really good, uh, <laughs> I was like, no, it's not a problem anymore. <laughs> but today with my cracked voice and cough and, you know, having given f three interviews and two long talks yesterday, mm. um, <laughs> I have to question it, you know. Um, but it's not nearly so important as it used to be. You know? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> well, I think, again, that's liberating to hear that we, you know, we have to question ourselves every day. We're never going to reach a point in life where we go, I've totally fixed all the issues and problems from the past. I'm working completely from a place of self-compassion and heart. Yeah. This is an everyday endeavor and an everyday question, which I love because it completely rallies against this much newer notion in the well-being world, whatever you want to yeah. call it, that you can be fixed, fix yourself. And all yeah. these weird words like or phrases, self-optimization, makes me feel very yeah. uncomfortable. 
This is every day forever that we have to ask ourselves these questions and have the awareness teamed with, importantly, self-compassion. So we don't look into the past and beat ourselves up and feel terrible about things. We have to find a peace. Absolutely. Um, And the the only other piece I was going to add is that part of the toxicity of this culture is it rewards that kind of unself-compassionate behavior. Yeah. You know, I get to be a respected doctor, well remunerated. Um, you, the more you ignore your kids, the more the world will think you're wonderful. Mm. Because you're going to put more attention to your career and your, being out there and informing people, you know, and, and yet, <coughs> you know, you're depriving yourself and your family of yourself. I don't, I'm not saying you're doing that, but the more you did that, the more successful you might be yeah. by the standards of the world. So that's a part of the toxicity again is we're rewarding the wrong kind of behavior. Yeah, people you know? constantly go, oh, how are you? <coughs> oh, I'm so busy. I haven't had yeah. a day off in two months. As a badge of, as a badge of Absolutely, honor. Absolutely, a badge yeah. of honor. Like, well done, that's amazing. Whereas if you were to answer, not much, just kind yeah. of <laughs> hanging around, people would go, what? That's... Yeah. Well, it's all right for you. We'll have some sort of snarky remarks. But it's, again, we've got it. We've got it so wrong. There's so many problems with society, and there's certainly a lot of toxicity that I think we all know is there. And I love that you're sifting it to the surface. There's no skirting around the edges. We're looking at it. We can properly examine it. Yeah. And that is the only way we'll be able to start to form, hopefully new ways of of dealing with life in every way because this book is all encompassing it covers it all and um thank you to you and your son for compiling all of this information because it, mm. it's unbelievably fascinating and it's a, a complete honor to have you at my house today to talk gabble Mate, thank you so much thank you <laughs>